On this episode, we look at innovative pedestrian crossings in Melbourne, Australia. We see how automated pedestrian gates improve safety at railroad crossings. A cooperative effort produced a new book on providing for journeys on foot in the United Kingdom. We check out an innovative driver's license program in Canberra. Historically, cities have expanded around the one-hour travel distance. And finally, we look at urban design in Melbourne. Stay tuned! We're in Melbourne talking with Philip Jordan, who's the principal road safety engineer with Vic Roads. There's a pelican crossing behind us. What on earth is a pelican crossing? Well, Pelican stands for Pedestrian Light Control. It's a device that was developed in Britain 20 years ago. And we've picked up the idea here in Melbourne in the last five or six years, and we've started to apply the idea of having a flashing yellow phase in the cycle, so that uh, when the pedestrians have crossed the road, the uh, drivers start to see a flashing yellow phase, and then they can proceed through, provided they give way to any remaining pedestrians. Now, what advantages does that have over your traditional mid-block crossing signal? And the big advantage is that it uh, reduces driver delays by up to 40% in peak hour. And so, as you can see behind us, we're on a fairly congested shopping street here in Baldwin. Uh, Cotham Road is busy, it's got trams, it carries, uh, I'm guessing here, 30,000 vehicles per day. A lot of pedestrians cross and it's important to keep the whole mix moving. And so, um, drivers with a 40% uh, reduction in delay uh, appreciate that. We found that pedestrians also uh, see no difference in the facility. They are uh, quite uh, happy to use the facility. They get across quite safely and the device is working very well. Yeah. Another uh, another member of the animal family that uh, you picked up from the UK is the Puffin Crossing. Yeah. What's a Puffin? Puffin stands for Pedestrian User Friendly Intelligent Crossing and it has uh, overhead uh, infrared uh, detectors, John. And these overhead detectors can sense if there is a pedestrian still on the crosswalk or not. If the pedestrian has totally cleared the site, then the detectors say there's no one left here, let's call up the green to the motorist pretty quick. And so it does that. If on the other hand you are a disabled uh, person or an elderly person or someone who's just simply taking a long time to cross, the detector recognises you're still there and it increases the clearance time for the uh, for the crossing so that the drivers are held with a red light for longer so you get that added benefit and peace of mind particularly for the elderly pedestrians in the community and on the other end of the spectrum school children what sort of school crossings do you have well probably the one that's uh, most widely used in the state of Victoria and indeed right through Australia with some minor variations is what we call a flag school crossing it is a pair of uh, white lines painted across the road. Just outside that there are a pair of stop lines. There are some red posts at the crosswalks and at the stop lines and the, uh, the posts at the stop lines actually have a flag placed in them. So that at 8 o'clock in the morning when the school children are starting to come along to that road to, to cross the road to go to school, either the school crossing supervisor or a responsible person in the area puts out two flags. The flags read children crossing and that becomes a regulatory traffic control device and it gives the pedestrians absolute right of way when they step onto the crossing. It's a very low cost device, it's been widely used uh, in this state for 50 years or more and um, it's uh, because it can be put in for not much more than a thousand dollars because drivers obey it, it is really uh, a very popular and well used device. What do you see for the future of pedestrian crossings in Victoria. What's what's the trend been over recent decades? What's what, what's going to be different 10 years from now? That's a very good question. We've certainly seen a move away from uh, grade separated facilities where we have overpasses or underpasses because our development in Melbourne is such that um, uh, there are very few spots where there are such high densities of, of pedestrians and high densities of uh, vehicles to warrant such a uh, device. Instead, what we've gone for is more the integration of the pedestrian and the motor vehicle by letting the, um, if you like, the, the pedestrian move to a painted or a physical island out in the middle of the road so that they stage their crossing of the arterial roads. We are trying to um, uh, slow down the traffic around the urban area. Just in the last month here in Victoria, we've introduced a 50 kilometre per hour urban limit. And that is a very positive step forward so that 
with lower operating speeds, pedestrians will get a fairer go when they're crossing. But we see a couple of things. This, this mix of pedestrians and drivers is, will be assisted with the uh, refuges, but we also see some high-tech devices coming in, such as the, uh, the Puffin Crossing. It's still only in small numbers yet, but it is increasing each year, and uh, we believe the Puffin Crossing, together with its uh, sister bird, the Pelican, is uh, some, really the way to be going in the future. We're in Melbourne talking with Charles Huber, who's a consulting traffic engineer. We have a great crossing behind us. Bars are going down for uh, the train. What happens for the pedestrians here? There are horizontal swinging gates that swing across the footpath to, to totally prevent a pedestrian crossing in front of the train. There's a, an emergency exit provision, so if a pedestrian were trapped, between the train and the gate, they could find an easy way out. What sort of trouble were you having with uh, pedestrian crashes at, at, great cross, at great crossings before you installed these? The pedestrians seemed to ignore uh, responding to the fact that booms came down or the uh, bells were ringing and they'd continue across in front of a train. We even tried a small mini boom called a pedestrian boom barrier, and pedestrians would duck under those and they'd still get killed. So this was a, a better method of providing a solid uh, prevention to separate the pedestrians from the trains. How long have these been in use and, and what's been their success rate? Well, they've been in use for at least 15 years, and as far as I know, no pedestrian has been killed where these uh, type gates have been installed. We're talking with Jim Walker, who's director of the London Walking Forum. What is the London Walking Forum? It's a network organisation. Um, we've got about 500 members and uh, we network the professionals who are involved in walking initiatives around the capital. Uh, and we develop best practice with them and give them training and things like that. And you've got a uh New publication you've had a hand in. Uh, what's it called? Yeah, that's right. It's this. It's this document here, uh, providing for journeys on foot. Um, and what we've done in the UK is we've networked together the uh, UK government um, with the Institute of Highways and Transportation, which is a sort of professional membership organisation as well, uh, an institution training body. Um, and we've we've uh, pulled the expertise from the Pedestrians Association in the UK, uh, the London Walking Forum, and uh, we've contributed some money from Europe as well for, as part of the uh, LIFE programme that we had running in London. Uh, and um, this book really, I, I'd, I'd recommend to people who have to actually implement walking schemes. Uh, we recognise that there's a real gap in having to sort of convince people that they need to do it. Um, in how to deliver it and what this does is in uh, I think yeah it's about eight chapters is goes through the details of, of uh, how to plan for pedestrians designing principles um, footway maintenance programs and uh, an important chapter in there about promoting walking as well uh, and, and appraisal and monitoring so it's, it's just a sort of standard text there just to create a baseline for practitioners uh, I think it'll be really useful what uh is that an unusual collaborative effort that went into creating this? I think um, we, we've got a very healthy relationship in the, in the UK between the sort of advocates, um, the policy makers, the academics um, and the, uh, the practitioners and I think that's really healthy. And so instead of sort of beating on each other's doors, we recognize we're all on the same boat and all trying to achieve the same thing. And therefore, uh, if we can pull that knowledge, uh, agree a, a common objective, and just work out how to best solve that. Um, we combine resources, it's time, it's, it's skills, um, to come up with projects like this, which I think you know, make a big difference. We're talking with Robin Anderson, who's manager of road safety for ACT Urban Services. You have something called Road Ready. What is that? Road Ready is a very uh, innovative driver licensing and education program that we've uh, introduced over the last 12 months. Um, it's uh, relatively unique in, in that it tries to introduce a heavy element of uh, attitude and behaviour change into uh, 
learning to drive, as well as the, the more conventional car control and, and uh, road rules that uh, young drivers have to get. Um, the main uh, difference is that um, our research showed that if you want to try and influence the behaviour and attitudes of young drivers, you need to get to them before they get behind the wheel, before, before the excitement of being in a car takes over. And uh, accordingly, in order to get your learner's licence, you have to do a 15 hour course, either uh, in high school or with a private company, uh, which concentrates on the risks and the complexities of driving in order to get your learner licence. Um, once uh, you've got your learners, you then uh, have to uh, undergo at least um, a year on the road where we encourage a strong level of supervised practice before you can uh, go for your test with a government licence examiner and then get your provisional driver's licence uh, you know, to go solo. Once you've uh, been driving on your own for uh, six months, you can then take a, a voluntary uh, course um, to uh, do again a facilitated discussion workshop which again concentrates on your or driving experience in the first six months and I guess uh, it aims at um, peer level discussion because we know that young drivers respond better to their peers than they do from an older authority figure and um, if you do this voluntary course, I guess the rewards are being able to uh, drop uh, your provisional P-plate display, with the, which most young drivers hate, and you also get some extra demerit points uh, against traffic offences. How does this program compare with other programs in Australia and, and around the world? Most Australian states are trying a variety of, of different graduated licensing systems for new drivers. Um, the ACT is different to most in that it um, concentrates much of the effort before the young driver goes solo and also tries to change um, their attitudes more than uh, say teach car skills or, uh, or road rules. Um, it was developed um, in conjunction with an international advisory panel who looked at best practices around the world and indeed um, we've just had the course evaluated by uh, Dr Nils Gregerson who's probably the, the world authority on young drivers who uh, developed the, a similar program in Sweden which has been very successful. We're in Perth talking with Professor Peter Newman of Murdoch University. You're Professor of City Policy. What is that? Well, I come from an environmental background and I moved into working on cities and their environment and found that I had to become a kind of social scientist dealing with policy. And uh, I, so I put the two words together, really, cities and policy, and, and uh, I try to deal with how cities change. How can we improve them? And what do you can actually do to pull it off? Not just the ideas, but what do you do to make it change? And you've talked about the one hour travel time. Uh, how does that relate to, to cities? Okay, cities uh, have certain characteristics that have been there since they began 6,000 years ago uh, through to now uh, and across the world. It doesn't matter what kind of city you live in, whether it's New York or Bangkok or Perth, the average travel time for everybody, the average, is around one hour for the day. Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter what kind of city it is. And it's kind of like built into the human psyche that we just don't like to travel a lot more than that. And, and we need a bit of time between work and home and that kind of thing. So we sort of build that in. Some have less, some have more, but the average is an hour. So. The technology that's developed after walking, walking you could go five to eight kilometres uh, in an hour, um, so uh, the one hour wide city is five to eight kilometres, surprise, surprise. Um, the transit city developed 20 or 30 kilometres because it does 20 or 30 kilometres in an hour. And, um, and now the car based cities have spread 
hugely, out 50, 60 kilometres. But they're reaching their limits. They can't, you, can't, you just can't spread anymore uh, with the one hour commute, uh, one hour average for the, uh, the, the, for the total day. So the, um, uh, the changes that we're now seeing, where people are trying to stop the sprawl of cities, the smart growth movement, how we can try and overcome the congestion problems and so on, are all because those technological limits have been reached and uh, we need to rediscover how to make our cities uh, functional again. What, what is the impact as the cities have spread out? Um, what effect has that had on, on how cities function? Well, the, the walking functions, which were built into cities from the beginning, um, they were still there when we built public transport systems because we spread the cities out but we still had walkable centres. So you walked to the train and then you walked at the other end. So you, you got in your, your, your walkable uh, time, which is so necessary for your own health, physical and mental. Um, but the car has completely disturbed that. Uh, the car you get into from inside your house and drive out and get inside your building. You just and you get in an elevator. It's, uh, it's destroyed walking and it's destroyed the walkability of environments in cities. And that is the key thing in this conference that we're talking about, how we can try and uh, win that back and, and to, to reconquer community spaces, both in our residential areas, the streets we live in, in our sub centres, where it's so important we can just walk or bike down to a local area where the services are, where you can get a coffee and meet your friends, and, and in our city centres. In a way, it's easier to do in the city centres because they were designed for walking. They go back to that walking city era. Um, and across the world, there's been a massive move to, to reclaim those spaces, and the cities that have done it best are performing best economically. Now the big challenge is how to do it out in the suburbs. How can we create walkable sub-centres so that we can bring that, uh, that quality back into cities for everybody? Because at the moment it's the poor who are getting the really raw deal. And, and it's very, very clear in Australian cities, less so in American, um, that the poor are going further and further out, more and more car dependent, and are getting less and less healthy because of it. We're in Melbourne talking with Nathan Alexander, who's an urban designer with Track Consultants. What does an urban designer do? An urban designer is somebody who designs settlements. Uh, I do anything from the design of whole new towns through to the design of individual spaces like a plaza or a park. We've got downtown Melbourne behind us here. What's the role of the pedestrian in downtown Melbourne? Downtown Melbourne has been designed as a traditional grid city. Uh, it's the centre of the metropolitan area of Melbourne, which is three and a half million people. And the downtown has uh, traditionally functioned, obviously, as the, the major retail and government centre for Melbourne. It still does. It's got around about 12-14% uh, share of the retail dollar. Uh, the radial public transport network feeds lots of people into central Melbourne. It's still the major employment centre for Melbourne. So there's very high levels of pedestrians and over about the last 15 years the local government, the central city government, has put a huge amount of resources into improving the amenity of the central city for pedestrians. What, uh, what sort of amenities are important to pedestrians? What do you do to make the place good for them? We've done a whole uh, array of different things to help with pedestrian amenity in Melbourne. Uh, the prime one probably is to widen out the footpaths where there's so many people already walking on the foot footpaths that they're crowded. Uh, it's a technique the traffic engineers use all the time in widening roads to provide more capacity. We've done exactly the same thing. So we count the number of pedestrians, we say there's not enough space here, we need to do something to reallocate the road space. Central Melbourne's got uh, traditionally two types of streets. There's uh, the big streets we call them, which are 30 metres wide, 100 feet wide, and then there's the, the little streets, we call them, which are 10 metres wide, 30 feet. And so with uh, both those types, of, those types of streets, we've been able to 
where there's uh, lots of pedestrians, which there are in the particular retail areas, we've been able to say, well, we can't, we don't have enough room for all the users that want to come along here. Something's got to give. Uh, sometimes we take parking lanes away. Sometimes we stop the private vehicles from travelling down the streets and widen the footpaths that way. Sometimes we can just say, well, there's actually not a need here for as much road space as we've given to the cars. Uh, sometimes where there's a slip lane that's not required, that the, the vehicles don't need that slip lane, they can just go up to the, the main intersection then turn left. Uh, we can just take away the slip lane and turn that into footpath or parkland. What does Melbourne have in the way of plazas and, and other types of pedestrian spaces? Melbourne's a traditional English colonial city, which is very much lots of streets that go from A to B, and uh, very few, well, in fact in Melbourne's case, no designated plaza areas. Um, what Melbourne did have traditionally was two markets, there was the Eastern Market and the Western Market, and they were um, a, a ring of, of stalls with a large central space. And so they did perform, as far as we can tell, they perform that role of being the, the, the social meeting place. But in the 50s and 60s, they were eliminated, uh, converted to office buildings, and Melbourne at that point had no real gathering spaces for people. So it's interesting, about that time, we had the first calls for a city square, and Melbourne got a, a temporary square in 1969, and then a permanent square in the mid-70s. Unfortunately, the design of the square was too busy and didn't work well, so we've had to redesign it. Um, even so, it's not in the right location. It's, it's on the wrong side of the main shopping street. At one side of the street, the, uh, uh, the area that's closest to the main railway station and has uh, shops along most of the street, uh, most, uh, for about a, a mile, that has three times the number of pedestrians travelling on it as the people on the other side of the street. It's got a lot of institutional uses. It's got a, a cathedral, it's got the town hall, it's got a museum, it's got a, a college of advanced education. So consequently, uh, the city square unfortunately is on the wrong side of the street and there's just not as, much, uh, not as much natural movement through it as there is on the other side of the street. So the city square, we just, just had a makeover, uh, is certainly a huge improvement over the original city square, but it's still not doing so well. So what Melbourne's done instead is to create those corridors we have, the, 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 the normal streets, more as uh, living rooms, by taking the private vehicles out, uh, paving them, putting more seats in, more rubbish bins, uh, better lighting, more trees, and using those as our town squares instead. Okay. Outside the centre city and the suburban areas, what can be done there to, to create pedestrian places? Uh, in fact, we've just enjoyed breakfast in one of those strip shopping centres uh, and they suffer a similar problem, that their, their linear routes, lots of through movement, which is, which is great for getting people there, but when you want to stay there and enjoy a meal like we did, uh, it's, it's much harder. So there's two things that can be done. Uh, one is that you block off the side streets at, at the main street and create that as a little square. Uh, and the other main way is that you just allow more trading to occur on the footpaths. Sometimes you can widen the footpaths. Uh, in many cases in Melbourne you can't. Uh, so you just allow people to put their tables and chairs out on the footpath and, and use that as a trading space. Uh, and pedestrians are incredibly flexible, as, as you're well aware, I'm sure. And so, uh, whereas you mostly might want to have a footpath that's three or four or five metres wide for the types of uh, volumes of pedestrians you get through, uh, if you occasionally have a, a cafe with the tables and chairs out there and you widen, the, sorry, you narrow the footpath down to one metre or two metres, that's fine. What is going to be a, a conference on new urbanism here in Australia. Yes. Um, how would uh, that concept apply to development of your city and the fringe areas? Uh, John, I've helped coordinate a, a major research project, a million dollar research project back five years ago, where we were looking at uh, what impact applying the ideas of new urbanism could have on the Melbourne metro area. And Melbourne over the next 15 years will grow by about half a million people and they have to go somewhere. And uh, because of the, the way that the building industry is, the development industry is, if we don't do anything, most of those people will go on the fringe. They'll go in and new, new 
the residential areas that are built over farmland, farmland or bushland. And we were looking at what you could do instead to put them back into the existing urban area. Uh, and we were concentrating on the, the town centres. We identified over a thousand town centres that ranged uh, from very simple ones that had just a, a corner store and a bus stop through to much more uh, busier, bigger, complex ones that had uh, train lines, tram lines, bus lines, uh, hundreds of stores, department stores, the works. And we're looking how you can, how you can fit all those expected population growth into those exi existing centres. And also, not just that, but the fact that the community is changing and that at the moment we're having half our population, half our households are one or two person households. They don't need the traditional quarter acre block with the, the three or four bedroom house and the large front and backyard. A lot more people now are looking for much smaller dwellings, uh, often with no grounds at all. They want to be able to go away for two or three months of the year and travel overseas or whatever it might be. And so they don't want the traditional quarter acre block. But our housing stock is still predominantly that and the new stock that's being developed is also very much a three and four bedroom house. Uh, in fact, most of them are getting bigger and bigger. So how do, we, how do we solve this? And we're saying you can bring more people into those existing centres. By doing that, what happens is that you stop the uh, decline, slow decline in population that's, that's happening in those centres. You're making better use of the existing infrastructure so it's cheaper for government. You're saving the bushland or the farmland that otherwise would be built over and paved over. And uh, you're also able to increase the amenity of those existing centres. Because you've got more people living there, you're able to improve the quality of the parkland that's already there. You're able to create new parkland. You're able to um, improve the, the quality of the streets, put more street trees in. Uh, you often can either save the, the stores that are there that otherwise would close because of the declining population or you get more stores in there. So you get a wider range of facilities. Um, because there's more people living around there, of a, a wider mix of people, it's a more interesting place to live. Uh, so overall, everybody benefits. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.